Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by KSU underscore fan, Drew Galloway. It is the KSO Sunday show, ready on time for you this week. Friday game kind of helped that out. Friday game was nice for a lot of reasons, I think. Uh, I enjoyed it, and I'm sure most people that were in attendance enjoyed it because it was a pretty carefree night after uh, the first half for K-State, where, I mean, you go into halftime, K-State felt really in control of that game, but... They didn't take advantage of a couple of opportunities. They left for sure six points out on the board. It could have been more if things had kind of gone into place a little bit better, but it didn't matter because they came out in the second half really strong, played well, and ultimately ended up pulling away and winning 31-7 to over Arizona, uh, which was a very, very exciting time. Uh, so I'll start with you, Drew. Uh, what was your number one takeaway from last night's game between the cats and the cats yeah, i think that my number one takeaway was probably just that was probably the case 18 that we anticipated at the beginning of the year it was the offense was kind of in a groove and clicking you got to see avery run a little bit more uh, i think he had more carries actually last night they had the first two weeks combined you got to see dj giddens have some nice runs dylan edwards did the most of his touches and for the most part, Casey was pretty efficient uh, passing the ball. So you kind of got to see the whole show on offense. And then the defense was as advertised and kind of shows that that two lane game might have been just a, a one off and something that the defense really needed to have happen to them. And it was probably better that it happened against Tulane than against Arizona. So it was probably the most complete game that they've played. And then this is kind of what. I've heard, I think it was Kirk Herbstreet and Pat McAfee talk about, and uh, Mark Helfrich during the UCF and TCU broadcast has kind of talked about that Casey looked good last night and still has a lot of room to grow and get better. And I think that that's probably the scary thing for the rest of the league. Yeah, I mean, I, I that's that's where I sit. We talked about this last night uh, afterwards where, they're, it, I mean, K-State played really well last night. There's no reason to complain about the type of game that they put together but you get to the end of the day and you start to think about kind of where things sat for the the offense and you go man there there's a scenario where they're able to go out and add two or three more touchdowns on top of what they did they could have been even better than what they were um but i think we we came pretty close to seeing that actual a game for case it i don't even know that last night was an a game overall it definitely was for the defense i mean i I don't know that you could ask for more against Arizona's offense and then special teams. It helps when you get the boost from Dylan Edwards taking the punt back. So uh, a fan, what were your big takeaways from the win over Arizona for K-State? Yeah, number one, you mentioned the defense. I think that the dominant performance after that first drive to to hold Arizona to seven points, I, I kind of thought this would be more of a shootout type game. I think I picked 38-30 for K-State to win it. I, I did not anticipate holding them to only one touchdown. So I, I was most impressed probably by that. Uh, I think they had one pass play over 30 yards for the game, which they came in one of the more explosive passing games in the country. Um, McMillan had averaged, what, 30 yards a catch against New Mexico. I know New Mexico is bad, but that's still really good. But the NAU game, I kind of chalked up to them not really wanting to be there. Uh and because they didn't play well in that game, but but just that that performance against that quarterback, even though uh, you know, kind of watching that game, McMillan and Fafita look like the two guys that they really have. They don't have a whole lot else. I mean, they had a couple of their receivers that were okay, but you know, McMillan still got his what 138 yards on 11 catches, uh, but 268 yards for Fafita. But you'll take that when you kind of shut out their running game. And then my second takeaway would be, I think this is the quarterback run game we expect from Avery Johnson. Um, I thought um, just watching, I didn't rewatch the whole game yet, but watching highlights, he made really good reads. And I thought the rhythm of the quarterback run calls was better. I think that's a credit to, to Riley and Wells and, and kind of figuring out when and where to make some of those calls. I thought that that rhythm was better. And, and uh, Avery Johnson really took advantage of it, had some nice carries. And for as many carries as he had, the other impressive thing is he didn't take a lot of shots. He didn't take hits, which I think if you're going to run him that much, you want him to be able to avoid 
uh, taking hits and, and protecting his body. So so he's here for the whole full season. So those are the two main things I saw in that game. I'll, I'll ask you this then, uh, fan. What is it that you think the the di- the difference maker was there for why he ran the way that he did in the game against Arizona as opposed to the first two? Was that I mean, where do you think the philosophy of Connor Riley and and the game plan was for the run game to look so different for Avery Johnson as opposed to the first two? Well, I, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I thought you know I thought there were a couple of reads against Tulane that he kept the ball when he should have gave it and gave the ball when he should have kept it. And I didn't, I don't think he had those mistakes, even though the number of reads wasn't as high. Um, he kept it once on a quarterback power off jet, which is not a play. We've seen K-State run jet a lot to receivers and to backs. And that's always been a play where the quarterback power off right off tackle is always part of that play. And I think we saw Will Howard keep it a handful of times, but. He had a nice run off that. And then most of his good runs were just off kind of old school zone reads, um, zone left, read to the right, zone right, read to the left. And I thought he made good decisions. And I thought we did a better job of blocking in space as well. I mean, that was one of my big complaints about the Tulane game is we were poor blocking in space. And I thought our receivers and our H-backs a little bit, even though they weren't, they weren't as involved in some of the arc releases we do, um, but we did a better job getting bodies on bodies, which gave Avery Johnson those little running lanes to get 10 yards down the field, get that burst, and then be able to wiggle outside and get to the sideline and not take a shot. So I think those kind of things are what I saw and just looking at the highlights of, of the big runs he did have. Drew, uh, I'll ask you this. Uh, if you had to give a, a, a grade and an assessment of Avery Johnson's play, yeah. Where would you go for this game, and where do you think the next step is? Because I think, I mean, even he admitted last night that it feels like each game there's been, you know, another step in the right direction, and maybe last night was an even bigger step than the first two games. So where is he at right now, and where do you think he goes next? Yeah, I'd say this was still like a B-plus, A-minus kind of game. Uh, He missed a few throws, still could have – some better touch at times. I know that the Dante Cephas had one really bad drop, but the second one that Cephas had bounce off his hands, I don't necessarily think is his fault. If Avery throws it a little bit lighter instead of just throwing a fastball in there when there was nobody around him. Uh, but probably a B plus a minus because you still only had 156 yards passing. I know that that's something that they want to continue to improve on, but, I think that we're all kind of kidding ourselves if the passing game didn't take a step in the right direction. So it's more of finding that same consistency because you can make the great throws like he made to Jace Brown on a third down play and some of the throws that he made against Tulane, but it's can you make the routine play every time? And I think that's something that will come in time, but we haven't gotten a full dose of that yet. All right, uh, let's continue on talking a little offense here. We'll get to a, a full scope of what the defense did because they were really good last night. Uh, obviously, we already talked to them. I mean, giving up only seven to Arizona the way they did it. Uh, and then there were some other things that Chris Kleiman pointed out that he really liked about what they did last night. Um, thinking of what the run game looked like last night outside of Avery Johnson – uh, it ended up, uh, I think people probably would walk out of there and go, man, that was a pretty lackluster night uh, from the run game and thought, man, DJ Giddens just didn't have it. He still ended with 86 yards and over five yards of carry. Um, and that's probably a pretty good highlight of how good DJ Giddens is, is that against Arizona on Friday night, it felt like a bad game for him. And it was still a pretty good game for a lot of running backs out there. Um, what did you what did you guys take away from K State's running back play last night, and how much of that is tied to the performance of the offensive line? Because I once again walked away from that game not as confident in the offensive line because I didn't feel like they gave the running backs the best opportunities at times, and we just saw some really silly penalties again. I mean, somebody get Carver Willis a map because that guy just continues to get lost upfield with no purpose. The, the ineligible 
uh, man downfield calls are going to drive me insane because they're just silly and pointless. Um, so overall, what did you guys see from the run game last night? Uh, and, and what does that mean? Big picture. If anything, you may, you may just say, eh, you know, it doesn't really matter. I still think this is an elite run team. I, I still think it's an elite run team based on, um, the success rate of the runs, um, getting it ran at 13. I'm going before garbage time. I he had a couple of carries after K-State went up 31 seven, which is kind of garbage point for, for analytics. Um, but he, he had 13 carries and eight of those were successful. So he had like almost a 62% success rate on his carries, which is what is a lot better than the Tulane game actually. And the UT Martin game, but as far as success rate per rush, he was more successful. And, and Dylan Edwards was actually a little worse. His, his success rate was only 33%. He had two really good runs, but then he had some runs that, that didn't do much. I, I don't blame him for that. It's just his success rate on runs was not as good. I mean, I think Drew pointed out that he was disappointed because Dylan had a couple runs he didn't score on, and his scoring rate is going down. And, and Drew was disappointed with that in the press box. But, uh, you know, our, our total success rate on, on the rushing game was 58% and average of 77.3 yards per carry. And if if you can do that, you're going to be uh, really good in every game. And that was our best success rate percentage of the season um, against, I don't know, I would say maybe Tulane maybe has a better defense than Arizona does, but I think that's still a pretty good defense we successfully ran the ball against um, in, in that game. So I was pleased uh, just because I, I, I go off success rate a lot and what I think is good. And they still average over seven yards of carry. If, you, if you're going to do that, you're going to be pretty good and you're going to be able to run the ball against most teams. Yeah, if Ben put what I was going to say a lot nicer. I was going to say that like we are just so spoiled with the K-State run game and how the offensive line has looked for the last two seasons that this is still a pretty good offensive line, but probably isn't as good as last year or 2022 yet. And we are kind of just, we're still a little bit hard on them. When you look at the raw stats, I mean, 235 yards rushing and like fan said, averaging seven yards a carry before garbage time. I mean, you're, you're going to take that every week and run with it. And I think almost every other school would call that like one of the best rushing attacks that they've had the entire season or in a really long time and with case eight now it's just kind of like oh that's just kind of a normal game so i think that it's still a very very good run game and run team and kind of like i said last night in the instant reaction i think that they've found their identity like this is a we're going to give the ball to dj giddens dylan edwards avery johnson and we're going to run the hell out of you and then we're going to be able to use that run game to set up play action and to be better in the pass game because you're going to load the box and we're going to take our shots one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, DJ Giddens last night with his performance goes over 2,000 yards for his career. Uh, and then that I think he's the, the 12th player to do it. Uh, and like we've talked about all offseason, he's in a position to where he could be number three after the end of this season uh, behind two really good players uh, and Darren Sproles and Deuce Vaughn. So he's had a pretty productive career, and I know that uh, I know Fan had some other notes on. Uh, well, both of you guys had other notes on DJ Giddens and just kind of the historical significance of crossing the two thousand yard plateau. Yeah, Drew, I think yeah, I, I'll give credit to Drew. You you can go ahead and give that one. Yeah, he's the third he's fastest pass. player to do it. Uh, so I mean, I, it just goes to show again. We are we we're on a generational run of running backs where it just seems kind of like a very routine for DJ Giddens to just have 86 yards, 87 yards, over 100 yards, and we're like, eh, whatever. But he is a really, really good running back, and, and I think that that's something that needs to continue to be highlighted because he's in a conference with really good ones, and he's just as good of, if not better than all of them. Yeah, I mean, he, we know how good the Big 12 is as a running back league, and I think not enough people are fully aware of just where DJ Giddens should actually be in that mix. I think sometimes they get confused on where to put him because it, it, he's not as flashy as the other ones, but, boy, his productivity is just – it's it's up there and better than a lot of them, I would say, and his reliability is really good. I mean, if you go and look at 
the the past handful of games for him now. Uh, he was on a big streak where he had hit over 100 yards rushing. He and Deuce Vaughn, both similar uh, occurrences from their sophomore to junior year where they ended their sophomore year on a good run of 100-yard games and then continued it into the next season uh, with how they kind of played things out. But he's been really good. I mean, he was great last season, but it, he basically took another step, uh, I think, right around the TCU game. And then the only other game where he really – struggled from that point forward was against Texas, but K-State as a whole had to abandon the run. But since then, uh, he ended last year with four straight games over 100 yards rushing, and then he started the year with two in a row. Um, so he, he got it to six before just having 86 last night. But he's been really good, and K-State's in a uh, good spot with running the football. Uh, anything this, else on – oh, go ahead. I was going to say, this guy's a much bigger name in the league, but DJ Giddens has been – way better than Ollie Gordon to start the season. Yeah. But that, I don't uh, think that I don't, but I don't think that national people will acknowledge that. Well they got Oklahoma State's probably got some stuff to get figured out there. Now they I mean they they abused Tulsa on Saturday. So if you, you think that that means everything is right in the world then good for you Oklahoma State. But um they're not in the best spot and they're it's it's gonna be a fascinating game uh next week with Oklahoma State in Utah, especially if Cam Rising is not able to go because Utah struggled with Utah State today. Um, and I mean, I mean, Utah State's got a salt hawk running their football team right now. I mean, how good can they be? Uh, so, I mean, man, people know, people know what I'm talking about there. Uh, last thing offensively that probably comes up as a concern, uh, we'll talk receiver here because. Drew pointed out last night as we were waiting on players to come in that a receiver has not caught a touchdown pass yet. So we're, you know, we're looking at the Kansas City Chiefs of a couple of years ago. Uh, we're just, you know, you're not going to have a receiver catch a touchdown. Uh, and then in addition to that, the Dante Cephas hype train. I mean, I don't know that it was moving, but it's like you're starting to take apart the pieces for maintenance off the track because and you're getting everybody off the, the train cars because there were some bad moments last night, a really bad drop. There was another one that not a great throw by Avery, but he also probably still should have caught it. And then there was a massive miscommunication, which you could pretty much in that moment tell that was probably another misstep by Sevis. He did end up having his first catch as a wildcat last night. Um, but what do you guys make of the receiver play through the first quarter of the season now that it's wrapped up? For the position, oh, go ahead. I'm. I, I go a little bit back and forth. I think um, Jace Brown has been pretty steady. wasn't great last week, but Keegan Johnson stepped up last week. Keegan, I thought, played solid. Um, Trey Spivey kind of seems like the third best at this moment, um, and I, I like what we've seen from Trey Spivey so far. So. So I like those three. I think a, a little bit of the missing wide receiver touchdown, I think, goes a little bit to Avery Johnson missing on some throws of those guys because a lot of times you're going to make those wide receiver touchdowns on longer plays that you hit uh, a guy in stride and he goes and scores the ball. So, um, But we've seen also the really good play design to get Lofton and Swanson open for two scores each uh, I thought yesterday was a perfect example. K-State likes to arc release their H-back or tight end or whatever. At, at, he might be at fullback, whatever. We like to arc, arc release them to block. We did it twice yesterday and turned it into play action passes, and those guys are both wide open. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you talked about it, Mason. Connor Riley doesn't get enough credit for the, the play designs he has in the red zone to get us to score, and I think we saw that perfectly yesterday with those two passes to Lofton and Swanson. And it's harder to do that in our offense for a receiver because you have those set-up plays to, to get those guys wide open because a, a defender is going to come down thinking they're blocking, and then all of a sudden they're running by you and they're wide open, and we saw that twice. So some of that is that. Some of that is maybe Avery missing a few throws, and some of that is our wide receivers have to be better. So I'm not super down on them. I'm, I'm probably more encouraged now. Um, honestly, than I was after week one. I think the last two weeks we've saw some strides from at least Jace Brown and Keegan Johnson. So 
hopefully we'll see them score soon, but I think they're getting better. Yeah, I think as a whole, the position has been fine. They, they, None of them really were great outside of Keegan Johnson in the two-lane game. Jace Brown was the only one that was good in the opener against UT Martin. And then Jace Brown was pretty good uh, last night as well as Keegan Johnson. So you kind of got to see both of them play pretty well. Dante Cephas, I think the, the thing that is more concerning than the drops is that it never seems like him and Avery are on the same page. And I think that that is much more of a concern going forward and why we're kind of, we kind of saw last night, Trey Spivey start to creep up and take some of those snaps away from Dante Cephas. I, I will say adding Trey Spivey to the receiver rotation in that first group probably is a higher ceiling than ha having Dante Cephas as that third receiver. So that'll be interesting to monitor, uh, but at, receivers not having a touchdown as a whole doesn't it doesn't bother me because uh kind of like fan pointed out if avery just makes that throw to jace brown against ut martin <laughs> instead of going down at the one that's a touchdown <laughs> yeah 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 that's uh that's that's a good point there one of those semantic type things uh anything else offensively that you guys want to get off your chest before we move on and talk about the real studs of uh friday night which was the defense just the uh, only the other thing I would – sorry, Drew. The, uh, the only thing I, I, other say, thing I would say is the lack of turnovers by the offense is really yes. impressive with a sophomore quarterback. Yeah, I was going to point that out as well as uh, the tight ends have been really, really good. And that's mm -hmm. without Garrett Oakley for mo most of the game last night. So Braden Lofton has been really, really good. And well, Will Swanson, touchdown machine. And I mean, as people are finding out in this region that uh, you don't even have to have a sophomore quarterback to have turnover problems at the quarterback <laughs> position. So uh, it's just it's just impressive in general to yeah. be, you know, a quarterback not turning the ball over right now. If you play in the Sunflower State, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure Wichita State's intramural quarterback has had a bad turnover problem. That's probably who I'm thinking of when I talk <laughs> about that. Uh, all right. Defense time. Joe Klanderman after his group both verbally and statistically got roasted against Tulane, bounced back in a big way last night. That includes after the first drive where Arizona took up half of the first quarter, went down, scored, I think 14 plays is what it was, and then K-State answered by basically doing the exact same thing um, with one extra play mixed in there. And I had somebody text me after that first drive, and it was kind of this uh-oh type thing, and they're not a K-State fan. But I said, I'm not going to say anything or get overworked about it because, I mean, obviously we know that's those are the plays that are scripted, whatever. Like, let's just see how the game develops from here. And how the game developed was Joe Klanderman came through with his defense. And part of it is Keenan Garber made probably a, one of the more game-changing plays early on in this season. I mean, the, the Romain strip sack. Uh, that led to the fumble touchdowns, probably number one right now. But Keenan Garber making that interception, kind of flying in from out of nowhere, changed the direction of that game. That's probably what set it up to head down the the blowout path that it went for K-State uh, because if Arizona hits that, who knows, and they've got this momentum. But they stepped up last night after that first drive and really limited Arizona and kind of a – in a in a bend don't break type of way because you see the you know the yardage there K State it's not like uh, they were overwhelmed by it now obviously some of that was Arizona trying until the very end for whatever reason to to score and do whatever uh, and getting some garbage time yards up there but for the most part Arizona moved the ball at times K State was just able to force them into a position where and Brent Brennan said it after the game kind of felt like they they needed to go get something done right then and there. Um, cause somebody asked him about kind of abandoning the run game last night. He just said, well, we were in a situation where we had to throw it, um, which I, th I thought was odd. Their philosophy there when, you know, they were only down 21 to seven and they had the football, but I think that kind of highlights the position that they felt like K-State put them in. Uh, so it was a good night for the K-State defense. I'll let Drew go first, uh, with his defensive thoughts. 
Yeah, Joe Klanerman was really, really good last night calling uh, the defense. Like like you said, it was kind of a bend don't break style of Arizona would get a few first downs and then it would kind of just be shot down from there. But kind of like I said last night, I said this in the press box and I said it on instant reaction. There's no way that K State's staff was going to let what happened to, to against Tulane happen again against Arizona because of how enriched this staff is defensively. And, and I mean, Chris Common has even called it a, a defensive backs program. So you really think that they were going to let that happen again? No. And, and we kind of got to see that all night. And the, the really impressive thing was just the, the constant pressure. Noah Fafita was only sacked once, but got hit multiple, multiple times. Brendan Mott was forcing holdings. Some weren't even being called because he was too, he wasn't close enough to the quarterback, which bizarre. Uh, but you kind of got to see a little bit of, of everything and you even got to see more pressure from the defensive ends and not having to blitz everybody, which again was a step in the right direction from the two lane game. Yeah, I, I would echo what Drew said that it's impressive to, after the first two games being a really kind of havoc oriented front seven and getting a bunch of, of tackle tackles for loss and sacks that, you know, we only had four tackles for loss, and Drew mentioned the one sack. So, and and part of that is just the way Arizona plays. They, you know, Fafita would drop back twenty yards sometimes. It seemed like, and but we would get pressure on him and force him to throw it out of bounds or um, things like that. So, so I I think using pressure in a way where you're not out, actually always getting to the quarterback but disrupting the quarterback was was impressive. Um, also. You know, that first drive, they were two for three on third downs. And the one third down they didn't get, they converted on fourth down. And then the rest of the game, they went 0 for three on fourth down and only three for 11 on third down the rest of the game. So it's impressive because you were kind of worried, like, oh, here we go. We can't get them off the field on third down to start that game. And then the rest of the game, that wasn't a problem. So changing that up and, and getting them off the field. And then the final thing, the first down, first drive, they edged us a couple times in the run game and were able to get the edge, and, and Conley was able to get a couple nice runs. And we took that away the rest of the game and then forced them to, to not have any ability to run the ball. Um, so those kind of Kladnerman talking points of wanting to stop the run, not giving up explosives, and then winning third downs, we saw all of those things come together in one game, which I think is what led to, like you mentioned, even though we gave up some yards, it really felt like a – very dominating defensive performance by the Cats. Yeah, if you go and look at uh, Arizona in the game, uh, their first drive, 73 yards. Uh, then the second one, and th that that might be up there too. I mean, the, obviously the interception was big, but coming out immediately after scoring the touchdown if you're K-State and forcing the three and out is significant. Uh, so only six yards there, but then a drive of 45, which ended with the interception. Uh, and then drives of 26, 38, 49. So even where they gave up some yards, uh, it didn't feel like it. And Arizona, their own worst enemy. Drew mentioned the, the holding calls uh, where it seems like there probably could have been even more over the course of the game. And shout out to Brent Brennan for not criticizing the holding calls after the game because there's a world even where if you feel like they were legit calls as a coach, you still go in very frustrated after the game and talk about how impactful they were and all that. He didn't do that in, in last night's game because I mean, what Arizona got backed up all the way to first and 30 after penalties um, on that drive where they, they you know only moved the ball probably like 15 yards uh, over the course of seven minutes of game time or whatever. Um, it was pretty comical to see how much time ticked off the clock there. Both teams really bad with their – clock management if you think about it to end the first half um now in in terms of what this means for the defense moving forward is this closer to what the overall vision is for the k-state defense and is this going to be i mean if if you can shut down fafita and mcmillan in this way i mean i know mcmillan still had a massive night but chris Kleiman talked about it afterwards it was a lot of catch tackle it wasn't catch run tackle which was big he Yards after catch last night, he only had I think, 21 is what the final number was. That's what that's what is going to protect you from getting burnt 
badly by him. So if they can do this to Arizona, how confident are you they can handle all the other challenges that will come their way in the Big 12? I, I feel good just because and I, I think I've mentioned this on the board and maybe um, after last week's game against Tulane, it's good to see them step up when they have more knowns. Like you, you knew a lot more about Arizona coming into the game because of, you know, even though they have a new coach and a new staff, um, you kind of knew what their strengths were based on where they were last year. You knew they had some decent running backs, but not a really strong running game. And I thought part of our problem with Tulane was there were more unknowns going in that game because you have this quarterback you've never, no one really has ever seen before. Um, and you don't really know what he's going to do. And uh, I think we saw a little bit today, Oklahoma was able to shut him down a little bit better than we were just because I think they got a game full of tape on him playing a good competition. And we had plenty of tape on Fafita and McMillan. So you're never going to take them away just because of the talent level. But I I think we saw a, a more true game prep for Klanerman and this defense in preparing for this game and then executing that game plan much better because they they had the knowns and they handled the knowns, which is something you want to see them do. And I think that translates better to the league and what we're going to see from other teams when we start playing other teams in this league. So uh, to me, that's a good sign. It's not a guarantee. You know, we could still have another Tulane game where we're giving up chunk plays like crazy. But I, I'm less worried about that after uh, Friday night's game than I was going into Friday night's game for sure. Yeah, I think that that's a lot more of what you kind of expect. I mean, I think that was actually a lot better than any of us anticipated even before the season began. Like if you say in June or July that K-State's going to hold Arizona to seven points, I think that everybody is like, holy crap, that's that that's like probably one of the best defensive performances of the entire year. But you look at that and it, it makes you more confident moving forward because, it, t- to be honest with you, it's not like there's like a – another like juggernaut kind of offense on k State's schedule outside of Oklahoma State that's really left on k State's schedule. So if you're, th- if you're saying that you can do this to Arizona, you should be able to do this to BYU. You should be able to do this to Houston. You should be able to do this to Cincinnati. So now it's, okay, you've done it once. Now go out and prove it the rest of the way. Uh, last thing, recapping last night's game that I want to specifically get into with you guys. Chris Kleiman immediately afterwards took full ownership of the end of the first half gaff where they just killed all the time without being able to kick a field goal there. Um, where in that moment, look, I, I get what he's doing. And, and Avery Johnson understood what he was trying to do there. Avery Johnson took ownership of it. Both guys are at fault for what took place at the end of the half. Um, and the one thing that was interesting about it for Chris Kleiman was he said this is not these are this is not a mistake I'm accustomed to making, which I think some people would take a little bit of disagreement with because there have been some moments over his career where you would criticize some of the clock management at times. It's by no means near what some of the other coaches out there are, but it does seem to pop up from time to time, and people probably overreact to it a little bit, uh, myself included. But you know, it is one of those things. Um, what did you make of how that thing played out and just how bad of a mistake was it? Not in terms of, oh, it cost them the game, because it obviously didn't, but in terms of kind of what it signals and how it could have cost them the game in certain situations. Um, what did you make of, of how that played out there, Drew? I'll start with you. Yeah, it's more bad because it's uh, what could have happened because that that that's kind of the play that, if the game ends up getting closer, you say, well, if you didn't screw up at the end of the half, especially if after you'd already missed a field goal and you had a pretty good drive going too, that you have that happen on top of it. But that's also something that I, I don't see happening ever again, or even like remotely close to happening again. That's part of Avery being a young quarterback and, and Chris Kleiman just, maybe having a little bit too much confidence in the situation with Avery. Uh, so I don't anticipate it happening again. It's more of like a, 
at the at the time that felt like a very critical portion of the game, especially after K State went three and out uh, to begin the the third quarter. But but really, it was just kind of like a blip in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, it, it, I looked at it as uh, it was a it was a, a a deal where the defense really picked up Coach Klein and, and the offense multiple times down that stretch. I mean, you get that perfect opportunity to get back-to-back possessions. You have first and 10 from the 14, I think, with 38 seconds left and both timeouts. Uh, and you're thinking, oh, we're set up. We may go score two touchdowns and put this game away. And like Drew said, we didn't score either one of those possessions. So you, you get zero on your back-to-back possessions. And then you're thinking, then if you give – Arizona opportunity to get the game, then then you look back and that's the game. Like we could be talking about those two possessions being the reason we lost that game, but fortunately the defense stepped up and made that not the case. But um, I, I like that Kleiman completely owned it. Um, I like I like that Avery Johnson owned it. Like accountability in your football program is never a bad thing. And when both of your your two of your loudest voices are both taking the blame and not making any excuses, no wavering, just saying, I screwed it up. It won't happen again. That's what you want to hear. Um, K-State overcame it. Like Drew said, we're, we're going to forget about it. We won't remember it. It's like seeing uh, Bobby Witt strike out with runners on second and third, but then Salvi gets a, a single and scores both runs. And HUD likes to say, talk about picking the picking Bobby Witt up. But that's I, I thought it, the defense picked up. Coach Kleiman and Avery Johnson. And to, to yeah, the, the talk, thing, oh, go ahead. Oh, the other thing that I was going to say was that uh, you talk about how it's good for uh, Avery and Coach Kleiman to own up to it. I think it's most impressive in a 31 to 7 win that Coach Kleiman addressed that during the opening statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. he wasn't asked about it yet. He said that there was like the third or fourth point that he like made sure to say in his opening statement was, hey, this happened at the end of the half. I screwed up. It was my fault. It won't happen again. And I think that's really impressive and shows how good of a leader Coach Kleiman is and then how good of a leader that Avery is to kind of come in and say afterwards and say, yeah, Coach Kleiman might have said that it was his fault, but it was actually my fault. Yeah, I mean, Chris Kleiman came in and he he just he came in with a purpose uh, after the game ended uh, on Friday night. And, like, he came in there and just kind of commanded the room. Like, he was on top of everything that he kind of wanted to uh, to, to say and do. And, I mean, it was, it was pretty impressive uh, to see what he was able to, to come out and say. So uh, I think that should be uh, kind of appreciated and, and looked back on by everybody uh, what he was able to do. All right. Um, I guess the last thing that I was going to uh, give you guys the option to discuss is we'll talk big 12 big picture here in a little bit, but based off everything that you've seen now, we do our power rankings every single week. And I, I wrote in them this week that I thought if K-State took care of business against Arizona, there was little doubt in my mind that they would be able to shoot to the top spot. Is K-State the best team in the big 12 right now? I, I'd say yes. I, you know, I would I would put either them or Oklahoma State pending Cam Rising sit, status with Utah. I think that changes Utah's situation quite a bit if he's out for any length of time. Um, Oklahoma State, I, I, you know, Drew mentioned Ollie Gordon not being great so far, and we've seen some some flaws from Oklahoma State, but I'm sure they're saying the same thing about us in, in our Tulane game. So. Um, but clearly, we have with this win, we have the best win of the three teams right now. And so, uh, to dominate Arizona, not just beat them, but to dominate and win 31 7, I think puts K State, you got to put them at the top just because of the quality of the win. Um, and then, you know, the next one up, I'd, I'd hate to say it, but could be the Cyclones, even though they're off this week, that we're not going to see them play. But that win over Iowa, even though Iowa struggled today, uh, so, uh, maybe you know, uh, especially since it was at Iowa. Although the the road team seems to win seems to win that game all the yeah. time. So I don't know. I mean, I would definitely say we can now say. I would say those four teams are your top four 
that are in the mix for for uh, Arlington at this point. Oklahoma State, Utah, K State, and Iowa State would be your top four. Yeah, with all things equal, I think that you kind of look at who has the best win, and I think that Arkansas sucks. So I don't think that really does much for Oklahoma they State. They are terrible. Yeah, and then I don't think that Baylor's any good, and that's Utah's best win. So <laughs> you kind of go, you base it on that, and it's okay. K State probably has. You could argue K State has the best two wins because is, is Tulane favored over both uh, over both of Arkansas and Baylor? Probably. Yes. Probably, so. probably by at least a full touchdown if not more, because uh, those teams are bad, which, by the way, Baylor, again, we'll get into it. Uh, they're running away from Air Force, but they benched Daquan Finn today, who uh, we talked about was kind of their, I don't know, last gasp for Dave Aranda to put together a truly competitive team. I uh, don't think that's going to happen. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's get into this now. I'm sure everybody's been waiting for it over the last handful of weeks, months, however long. You got a preseason look at the list, and I'm just going to remind everybody of it. Here is what the preseason fraud watch looked like. Everybody was probably like, oh, man, where's it been? Been waiting on it. So there it is. That was the, the preseason fraud watch. There have been some changes through the first 2.9 weeks of the season because we're recording this as games are still going on. Um, it'll be pretty easy to tell what I mean by games are still going on, and we're 2.9 weeks into the season so let that burn into your memory right now and see where everything's at look at that we had five studs entering the season in the big 12 four guys without homes they were mediocre or too early to tell and then the watch the advisory the warning uh, a couple guys have moved down some guys have gotten a bump up um let me see one guy got a bump up from the too early mediocre tab. He is now a stud. We've had a couple of studs drop out. Um, one guy has moved out of the watch advisory warning territory. Uh, I'll let you guys guess. Who do you think are some of the biggest movers uh, from the preseason fraud watch to the week 2.9 fraud watch? I, I, I would say that Kenny Dillingham might be a guy that moved up. Hmm. Yeah. I think – a guy with initials LL may have moved down. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, let's let's dive into it. Um, there it is, the, the week three Big 12 <laughs> fraud watch. Uh, yes, only four studs now. Uh, I just – look, I mean, we're colors everywhere. Chris Kleiman, Mike Gundy, Kyle Whittingham, still ballers like they've been for their entire career, basically. And then Kenny Dillingham, he's got to be a stud right now because – Pretty much everybody else that has a voice at K State Online, the entire offseason wanted to say <laughs> they're going to be really bad. They're easily the worst team in this league. Oh my gosh, they're going to be terrible. And here I was saying, look, I'm not telling you that they're going to be an eight win team, but I think that they are better than Cincinnati. I think they're better than Houston. I think they're better than BYU. And show enough, Pappy, they are 3 0 with a win over an SEC team, a road win against, you know, a Tulane adjacent type team in Texas State. So Kenny Dillingham is a stud for in year two with a program that was just battered down by the idiocy of Herm Edwards, uh, administration at the school that does not care about athletics. Here he is amidst it all with a 3 0 team. And now, based on the way that the rest of the Big 12 is playing out, Arizona State might have a really good chance of becoming bowl eligible this season, which would be wild for them. And then in no man's land, like I've workshopped a ton of different names for this category. It's either not important slash flat suck, um, not significant, just there a lot of different things. It's just going to be no man's land. And you can figure out what that means for each coach. Um, I will say Matt Campbell, Willie Fritz, Brent Brennan, the best candidates to either be there all season or make a move up. Scott Satterfield and Kalani Sataki, they will never leave that category. This is purgatory for them. They they are not good enough or s special enough in my mind to even be considered a fraud. They, they're just losers, um, which is sad. I mean, I, I like Kalani Sataki, but he's just proven to be a pretty mediocre loser now. 
Uh, nothing wrong with that. Fraud Watch, Sonny Dykes, Gus Malzahn. That's why it's 2.9 because Sonny is going to oh. drop like a rock if TCU blows this massive lead <laughs> at home to UCF uh, and Gus can keep his spot in the Fraud Watch uh, selection. And then, yes, Lance Leipold, d- old double L. Um, it's never a good look when you lose your offensive coordinator to a Big Ten school like Penn State that was really bad on offense last year. And now people are starting to say, hey, look at what Penn State's doing on offense. That Drew Aller looks like he might actually know how to play quarterback now. Uh, and then your team looks like they don't know how to play quarterback. Everybody hates the offensive coordinator you hired. And now you're one and two because you've lost to UNLV at home, who do- also didn't know how to throw the football in a low scoring game. You make not at home. Uh, good point. Good point. Uh, and then <laughs> you think about the, the loss to Illinois. I watched Illinois against Central Michigan today. I watched way too much of that game. Illinois is still not a very good team. As much as I want to support my friend Alec Bussey, uh, they're just not very good or special to watch. That's a bad loss. So Lance Leipold, one and two, you are on fraud watch, sir, because while it's impressive that you did hire Andy Kotelnicki, he is no longer there to uh, kind of hold your pants up for you. So we'll see uh, if Lance slides anymore. Advisory Joey McGuire, I mean, this guy, the snake oil salesman of all snake oil salesmen, just coming in there wheeling and dealing. Honestly, he and Gus Malzahn, very similar. Uh, Look at all my four and five-star recruits that I'm bringing to these places that have sucked for the eternity of our program. Okay, that's awesome. That's great. It's going to give you some preseason buzz. Now actually go out and do something on the field with those big shots. Uh, That has not happened yet. And you cannot fool me with that blowout win over North Texas today, Joey. I see right through your act. And then the fraud warning, two guys that are locked into that spot. They will never leave. Deion Sanders and Dave Aranda, my two least favorite coaches in the Big 12, um, just because I think they're irrelevant and not even worth uh, our time. Again, Dion, I see you just sneaking past Colorado State tonight. I don't care. does not matter. You're going to get wall up to the next couple of weeks. Dave Aranda, if Daquan Finn not going to work out for you, you're probably in a bad, bad spot. And then Neil Brown, welcome to the bottom of the league. Um, again, this is another one where I feel vindicated because all offseason I started to see people buying into the West Virginia hype train. And I was like, where is this coming from? Uh, I would gladly point out that Derek Young and I both were like, I don't know, like the schedule kind of helped them out. They're a pretty good regression candidate. Boy, have they regressed because that loss to Penn State, it looked worse after Penn State struggled at home with Bowling Green. And then today, a just monumental collapse against a terrible pit team. So Neil Brown, fraud warning, and uh, Ren Baker has to be looking through the fine print of that contract extension they gave him to figure out, <laughs> did I make that big of a mistake, and can I get out of this and hire my own guy? Which, Ren Baker, Seth Luttrell available, the OU offense clicking all of a sudden, reunite North Texas connection there. Let's see it. Bring Seth to the Big 12. He's he's always been on the cusp of it. We know that. Uh, so that is your uh, week three fraud watch, and uh, it's getting dicey for Sonny Dykes. This would be a terrible loss for him. Uh, BYU, or uh, sorry, Baylor and Colorado, most fascinating game of the week next week for your fraud mm-hmm. watch. I, I would oh, like boy. to ask formally, who are you rooting for in that game? Uh, Baylor, because, <laughs> Dave, because Dave Aranda is a lifeless, no good football coach, <laughs> head coach. He's a great defensive coordinator. I'm not going to take that away from him. Uh, but how embarrassing if you're Deion Sanders to lose to the total opposite personality that you are. I mean, Deion Sanders is like the color neon, neon green or yellow. And Dave Aranda is like the color of water. You know, he's clear, just nothing going on there. Um, so, and I actually feel bad for Dave Aranda. I know I say all these mean things about him. He doesn't deserve it. It's just you are what you are sometimes. Some guys just, you know, you're a nice guy, but you suck. And I think Dave Aranda is a nice guy that sucks. Uh, Neil Brown, same type of deal, but he's a little bit more brash about it. Like he's going to push back. And it's like, Neil, I've seen you go five and seven quite a bit. So ease up. Um, So, yeah, I'm definitely on the Baylor wagon 
next week. So. Uh, the other the other thing that I'll point out is as impressive as Arizona start has Arizona State start has been, and I, I was one of the doubters. Mm-hmm, you were, uh, but but uh, the SEC team that they beat is currently losing by four touchdowns to Toledo at home. So that that uh, probably doesn't make that a <laughs> well, great point. Uh, an SEC win is an SEC win. Football's football, Drew. You forget that, I think. And I would also like to point out that that's another thing that's a negative mark against Dave Aranda because Toledo loses their starting quarterback, Daquan Finn, to Baylor, and they're able to go on the road and blow out an SEC opponent. So and blow out you're just Schaefer. proving my point for me. <laughs> uh, another great point. Another Dave Aranda quarterback. I mean, just... It's a bad night to be Dave Aranda, even though they're about to win by 30-plus. Uh, well, that's even another negative for Dave Aranda. Do you not respect our troops? So that's just – that's what I would throw out there if it were me. If I was in his position, I would not be losing to the Air Force Academy. I would give those guys the honor and respect that they deserve. Uh, but, yeah. you know, I'm not in that position. So he's the one that has to make that call. And uh, some of us make choices in life and he just made a poor one. So, all right. Uh, that is your uh, week three fraud watch right there. Uh, I'm sure people will just enjoy seeing Lance Leipold sitting there uh, and he needs to get things figured out rather quickly with his group because it's they're in a not so good spot right now. And it will be a fascinating one and two game next week. KU at West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, that'll mm-hmm. be a kind of a fun one to, to watch and take in. All right. Uh, let's dive into talking about the rest of the Big 12 from this week and some of the takeaways with our college football outsider. Uh, Drew, what is your biggest Big 12 takeaway from the weekend? Ooh, that, that's a good question. I think that the the biggest takeaway this weekend i think is that the top is probably where we thought it was and the bottom could be could be rough i mean you've already pointed out west virginia baylor again just looks like they're kind of trekking towards the bottom houston has looked pretty bad in the first in the first week looked better and now they're kind of beating the crap out of a bad rice team but i still don't think that they're going to be very good Cincinnati also kind of a fraudy two and one start to the season. Uh, I, I think that's the most fascinating result because it won't be over by the time that this is uh, finished up recording. But BYU is kind of struggling more with Wyoming than I think that I thought that they would. I know that BYU's offense isn't great to begin with, but seeing that as only a 17 to seven game as we're recording this right now, it is a little bit surprising because Wyoming got the, the doors blown off of them. Uh, by Arizona State. Oh, and then yeah, by, by who was that? <laughs> yeah. By, by Stud Kenny, yeah, by the, Kenny Dillingham? Is that what you're... Oh, yeah, I remember that. So to kind of see that, it just shows that next week, that if K-State plays solid, plays how we kind of expect them to, that I think that they could win by a couple scores at BYU, even with the environment being what it's going to be next weekend because I, I just don't think that BYU has it offensively to really challenge K-State. Yeah, I, I would say takeaway number one is is you have Big 12 teams taking advantage of bad opponents. Um, Oklahoma State, Utah, BYU, Colorado, Houston, Cincinnati, and Texas Tech, all playing teams ranked 90 or worse in the F plus rankings. Three, uh, five of those teams are 100 or worse. Um, KU losing to a 67 ranked UNLV is a bad look for this conference. West Virginia losing to a 65 ranked Pitt is a bad look for this conference. And then, like we said, those two teams playing next week at one and two, definitely the two most disappointing teams in the league um, based on preseason expectations I think most people thought you know those teams would be at least two and one coming into their their first big 12 game um, and then you know I, I think the story to me and not just the Homer story is k-state is got the best win in, in the league so far and did it in a dominating fashion against a team that many has picked at least fourth or fifth in the league some people had them higher than that in Arizona so 
I think K State deserves a lot of credit for getting that win after surviving last week against Tulane and then going into Big 12 play and traveling to BYU, which will be starting at this time next week, <laughs> which is hard to believe. Yeah. Um, as we record. So, um, a big chance for K-State to get to 4-0 and uh, set themselves up for a big-time showdown in two weeks against Oklahoma State. Yeah, that, I, that is uh, that is fascinating to kind of see how this thing is, has played out for the Big 12 now because, look, the, the Big 12, I think, has deserved a lot of respect over the last couple of seasons. The, the issue right now, though, is, and this is where they're going to get killed perception-wise, is the teams that you needed to kind of step up and be better and be good uh, where there were expectations. Um, you look at, I mean, uh, Texas Tech, West Virginia, KU, mm -hmm. those teams not living up to it hurts because that's where there was some national perception and buy-in. It's not going to help the Big 12 to have a 3-0 TCU or BYU or Arizona State right now because – it's pretty easy to kind of, you know, just sh shoo those off and say, eh, whatever, you know, weak competition, whatever else. You needed the teams that people kind of had fully bought into to be at the top. And really right now, K-State and Utah are the only ones living up to that. And I would throw Iowa State into that category. Um, but I, I think – and I think, you know, there's a lot of affinity for – for Matt Campbell there nationally. So that probably helps the big 12 in this circumstance. But I do kind of wonder, like we've seen Iowa not look very good. There are other, uh, you know, there are other times out. So how much does that hold up? And also I think a lot of people are starting to recognize a little bit more like Iowa state has a pretty hard ceiling that they've hit. Campbell has to find a way to get them over the top of that and kind of uh, blast through it. I think for me, the biggest standout this week in the Big 12 or the most notable occurrence, I mean, it, it probably has to be KU losing to UNLV. That just, it wasn't something that computed. Like, I I don't think Jalen Daniels is some savior like KU people thought. Um, I think that they're in a position where you, you'd miss Jason Bean uh, a decent amount. And I think we're learning that. Andy Kotelnicki probably more than depending on a quarterback or whatever going on there. But the situation that he's put them in right now is really tough because three touchdowns of six picks after non-conference play. Uh, after last night, he was 85th in the country in his ESPN QBR. And the mistakes that are being made, it's not just like, oh, you know, he threw a 25-yard a ball down the field that got picked off at – uh, the opponent's own 30-yard line or whatever, he's turning the ball over on significant drives or in situations that give the opponent loads of momentum and in a spot to score. Or in the case against Illinois, he just gave him a free pick six, like the, you know, I mean, just easy money touchdown for him. So that's the one that's probably the most disappointing and surprising right now, the way that that's played out. Because as much as K-State fans like to give uh, him loads of of crap. He's never been this bad in his career. I mean, you're looking at a, a situation right now for Jalen Daniels where he's playing as close to as poorly as he did his true freshman year during the COVID season, which is not a fair time to, you know, grade anybody. You know, 18 years old. Well, he was younger than that. He was 17 when he was playing that COVID season. And then everything thrown on top of that, and it makes sense because I don't think anybody would seen Jalen Daniels throw as bad of a ball as he did for the one that got picked off by Xavier Scott last week since Justin Gardner got the free pick six in the game in 2020. So the KU thing is probably the most notable because I just thought they'd they'd bounce back. That's, that's probably how much faith uh, I had in Lance Leipold. And that's why, I mean, I know that fraud watch is kind of a joke and tongue-in-cheek type thing, but it really is something to monitor with him where he is no doubt a really good football coach and has put KU on a track that is far better than anything they could have imagined. But when you start to lose your pieces, how do you pick them up and, and keep the train moving? And other coaches in this league have, have proven that they can do it. Mike Gundy has had tons of different coaches under him and he continues to churn out 
nine, 10 win seasons every year, be a threat to win the Big 12. Chris Kleiman in year six has his third offensive coordinator. And here he is possibly with his best team since he's been at K-State. And it's never been a drop off. It's either continued on or it's gotten better. He's changed defensive coordinators. And then he's you know been stable elsewhere. Uh, Kyle Whittingham, same type of deal. Like he's lost guys. He's kept it rolling. This is where Lance Leipold has to prove where his chops actually lie and how competitive he can be long term uh, at a high level in the Big 12 in the Power Four is when guys start to get poached because when you're good, that's what happens. How do you sustain that success? And it's it's too early to tell how that goes right now, but that's why they're in the position that they're in. So it'll be fascinating to, uh, to me to see how that kind of plays out. But I think KU and West Virginia, most specifically, those are really bad for the Big 12 national perception-wise. Um, it might be good for K-State's schedule uh, if you think about those teams not being good because those – Outside of Oklahoma State and Arizona, were and I the road game at Iowa State. Those were the two other tough games on the schedule this year for K State, and all of a sudden they seem lighter than what they would have been. So it'll be interesting to watch uh, moving forward as uh, we we wind down here and see. I guess maybe by the time we end, we'll have a, a final in the TCU UCF game, which is going to come down to the wire after TCU bad fall start had to sell for a field goal, and they're only up six. Uh, moving on, let's highlight and preview K-State BYU real quick for next week. Cats, as a fan pointed out so nicely, uh, will just be kicking off when we're recording this at 930 at night. Uh, so everybody just stay up as late as you can and uh, see what happens. Or just you know go to Provo, have the time of your life. It'd only be 830 there, so that's a little bit of a boost. Um, we talked a little bit about BYU tonight and where they, they kind of sit. Looking at going to 3-0 and in non-conference play with a road win at SMU and then, you know, what could have been a, a tricky-ish game against Wyoming. Um, what do you make of the team that K-State is going to see on Saturday, Drew? It's kind of a mixed bag, especially offensively. I, I don't think that BYU is necessarily the, the most flashy offense that K-State will play against. But but defensively they're they're pretty solid. They could cause some issues for K State, and especially within the environment and kind of getting used to the altitude and everything. That K State could have some problems. But offensively, not super inspired. Uh, Chase Roberts is a pretty good receiver, but Ratzloff is very prone to giving the ball to the other team. So I think that if K State can take advantage of that, and, and even plays just even a few notches below how they played last night, I, I think that KSA wins probably by two scores. Yeah, it's it's probably debatable. Are they the third best team we've played? I mean, I, Tulane probably pretty even. If you look at F-plus going into the, to this weekend, Tulane was 55 and BYU was number 58. So they'll probably be similar places next week, even with Tulane losing. Uh, like Drew said, their BYU offense is not very good. Defense is solid, so so uh, K State's going to have to handle that. I think it will be a much. I think it'll be. A, I don't. I don't know much. Maybe not is better a good word, but it'll be a tougher environment than Tulane. Definitely, I think BYU does have a good stadium and a good crowd, and they'll be up for that game. Uh, since we'll be coming in as you know probably a borderline top ten team, um, coming into their stadium, so uh, that will create a challenge in. You know, just the new environment, altitude, all that kind of stuff that you guys mentioned as well. So those are challenges, but but I like K-State to, to not, you know, the, a lot of people would look at this as a trap game between Arizona and Oklahoma State. But I I like the makeup of this team and the, the, the way they handle situations. And, and I think they're mature enough, even though there's a lot of new players, I think they're mature enough not to slip up. In a, in, a, in a game they really should win on the road, even though it's on their own. This is a team they should beat. Yeah, it'll, it'll be fascinating because I think really the the biggest threat to K-State next week would be the crowd that you're going to see. I mean, they they seed over 60,000 there, and if BYU is 3-0 and and K-State, even wherever they sit in the top 25, that is going to be a significant game uh, for them, and that, that will be a juice crowd late at night. And 
you know, I I don't know how much stock you want to put into the late kick, but um, I mean, it's not like K State's going to go out there, however early, and try and adjust uh, the one hour time change. But it, there's got to be some little element of kicking off a game at nine thirty local time, just not jiving well and like there will be some things that you have to fight through and be a little bit sharper than you normally would at that time um and maybe not necessarily when the game starts although sitting around all day in a hotel room waiting for an 8 30 kick but 9 30 your the time that you're used to that your body's used to is significant it's probably one of those that would kick in more so as you're sitting there waiting for the offense or defense to get off the field and it's 12 15 back at home and you're probably yawning on the sideline or something like that could happen. Um, and that's why I think you know, K-State getting out to a fast start, similar to what they did against uh, Arizona. As long as they do that, I'm not overly concerned because BYU, despite what the record is going to look like, they're not a very good football team yet. And as Drew mentioned, Radslaff is very turnover prone. And uh, K-State has shown defensively, that they're stepping their game up in terms of forcing turnovers this year. To have the three through three games already is significant, and they made some very timely ones too. I mean, all three have come at the right time. They've been significant. So it'll be kind of interesting to see what that uh, ends up looking like next week. Uh, Prediction for K-State BYU, early final score call for that game from the both of you. Fan, you can uh, go first. Yeah, I think – I can't remember. I picked K-State by more than two or three touchdowns in the summer. I usually update them the week of the game. I'll look at the numbers a little bit more. But I I do think this is a game that K-State pulls away in the second half and wins comfortably um, down the stretch. Um, I'm going to go with 31-14 Cats. Uh, I will go 38 to 13. Uh, good guys. Uh, I'm in a similar boat, Drew. I go 38 17, but that might be too many points for BYU because after what the K State defense did, uh, their last three halves of football have been really, really good. They've really, you know, they've played six halves of football this year. They've, they have one bad one, and the other five have been really good. Yeah. So um, that's, One of those things that in the moment, and especially since it was only week two, it's hard to have that perspective. But now we can zoom out a little bit more and kind of see what it looks like. Uh, So I guess I'll uh, I'll try and be positive there, which is uh, an oddity for me. But I I do that a little bit more, which I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's odd that I'm so positive and kind uh, to to the football side more often. But I don't know why that might be. Uh, Real quick before we finish things up. I want to remind everybody that there's no better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats and the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will score off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. And whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages that's cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So a good reminder for everybody on cats to Ireland. Uh, top 25 will come out on Sunday as people uh, hopefully have listened to this and see everything that goes on with it. Um, where do we have expectations for where K-State will end up? So just a little highlight as to what has gone on in the top 25. No major uh, shakeups, at least fully in front of K-State. Utah and Oklahoma State were the teams directly in front of K-State. They won pretty easily uh, this weekend. But do you think because of K-State's dominant win over a team like Arizona that they can get that bump up over some others that you know maybe there are some bigger flaws with Utah and Oklahoma State right now? And the question mark of Cam Rising, who did dress today uh, in Utah's game, but he did not play. Uh, Zach Wilson's little brother started instead. For Utah, um, where do you expect K State to be when the polls come out on Sunday? Yeah, it, it's going to be tough because no one really is lost ahead of them. Um, they may maybe a better question is where do you think they deserve to be right now? Yeah, in regards to the the rest of the country, because we talked about how good the Arizona win is, 
Yep. Tulane, easily the best one and two team in the uh, country right now. Uh, so where do you think K-State deserves to be relative to others? I would say maybe 11, 12 is probably where I say, I think knocking on the door of the top 10. Yeah. French top 10, 11, 12. But my guess is that the top 25 looks pretty similar this week as it did last week. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of frauds out there, so that's, uh, not shocking. Frauds is in the people that make the polls and, uh, USC at 11, they they kind of hid from everybody this weekend and didn't play. Similar to Iowa State, week three buys are a soft move, just throwing that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, right now, like, the only, the only ones that I could argue K-State should probably move in front of, there are four teams uh, that I would do that with relative ease in pleading my case and feel okay about it. It's Oklahoma State, Utah, USC, and Penn State. Um, and you know they're just they're not going to move a team like Penn State down, uh, even though they, they probably should. And then you're you're probably right. So I think K State right now probably is the tenth best team in the country in terms of what we perceive them to have and where their resume at this point in the game would kind of put them. But we'll ultimately see how that uh, ends up playing out. So all right, well we uh, have gone a little bit longer than I wanted to, and uh, have taken Drew and Fan away from. Their Saturday nights, which have been free because we've got no K-State football tonight. Uh, they took care of business on Friday, uh, which maybe that's the final question. Drew, how did you enjoy the Friday game? Do you want more of them as long as they're at home? As long as they're at home and as long as K-State wins, Friday night game, excellent. Fan? I enjoyed it as long as – the game I coach is not on a Friday night because if we move ours to Thursday, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, I controversial take of me. I pointed it out on Twitter this morning uh, when I, I got up and I saw that uh, Keisha had tweeted out about the beautiful start to the morning at the Wamigo cross country meet. And I thought, man, it's odd. I, I haven't seen uh, anybody complaining in the cross country community about all these Saturday football games for all this time and how it's taking away from the kids and all this. Um, and then nobody that, you know, all the people that were like, Oh, Fridays are for high school football. None of them wanted to give appreciation to the TV networks in the big 12 for doing a solid for the soccer teams, the volleyball teams, the cross country teams that were out there grinding away on Saturdays and actually got a chance to sit down and watch their beloved Wildcats on Friday night, not have to worry about, you know, Oh man, we're going to be here or wherever. Oh, or, you know, that fifth, that fifth, that fifth grader that's out there having to listen for score updates while he sits on the sideline and hearing that Ron Prince lost to KU again, you know, that, that was not fun for me to be in that position. So would have much preferred a Friday night game, uh, you know, every every now and then for that. So just want to point that out. Uh, you know, let's not make it all about one thing and everybody involved. It's also happened once in the last 11 years. So I, I think that people can kind of get over it. Yeah, it's uh, it's even less than a once in a decade thing that happens there. So, and there are a lot of other teams to sift through in the Big 12 to where, um, if the Big 12 is smart about this, they'll be able to rotate well enough to where it's not like this is a common occurrence for K State. I do think it will be more frequent moving forward. I do not think it will be 11 years again before K State plays another Friday home game. But just know K State's not making that call. There is a school in the state that is making those decisions for their ESPN Plus buy games that they could dictate on what night they're played on. Uh, they've chosen to play them on Thursdays and Fridays. K-State's not going to make that call. The Big 12, ESPN, Fox, whoever, they might do it, um, but it's not going to happen frequent enough. And just because it inconveniences one side for one night, it helps out a whole lot of other people, and it's good to keep that perspective. And most of the time, I'm joking around, and I'm trying to give people loads of shit being dead serious in this situation think about the other people it was good for them and uh that's where i'll end it so for drew galloway ksu fan i'm mason vo thanks for listening to the kso show we'll be back again on monday getting the week started thoughts on chris Kleiman's 
press conference as the Wildcats prepare for BYU with the extra day's rest and preparation.